at a customer that made last year 1.4 million in profit. For first glance, I would say, wow, that's so nice. But on the second glance, we checked his balance sheet. In the beginning of the year, he had $3 million of inventory. And at the end of the year, he had $6 million of inventory. So that 1.4 million was buried in that inventory. So basically, no money for him. Iran Hirschkorn, your host of the e-commerce mindset podcast. In this episode, I talked to Nachman Lezer, who is the CEO and founder of ConnectBooks. We talk about his software, ConnectBooks, and how it can help Amazon sellers better understand their profitability. We also talk about his goals for business and how he uses the power of focusing on one thing to uh, do better in business overall. So I think you'll find this conversation an interesting one, learn more about the tool and also about the mindset of growing and scaling a business. The episode is sponsored by Incrementum Digital. At Incrementum Digital, we help you scale your business on Amazon using Amazon advertising, using uh, listing optimization and helping you improve your creative and listings, keyword copywriting, SEO and ranking all on uh, Amazon. The podcast is also sponsored by 8fig.co. 8fig is your best solution for growth capital for your business. It's the beginning of the year. And if you want to make sure that you don't run out of inventory and have the growth capital that you need in order to grow and launch new products, check out 8fig.co. You can visit their website to learn more. Enjoy this episode with Nahman. Okay, so glad to have Man Laser. Is that the right way to say it? Laser, Nahman Laser. Nachman Lezer, okay. On the podcast, Nachman is the founder and CEO of ConnectBooks. Speaking of Connect, I've had a chance to connect with Nachman now at uh, multiple events, like over the last uh, year or so. I know I've seen you at several events. I know you also are definitely one that uh, is networking and within uh, within the e-commerce and, and Amazon seller space. And really wanted to you know have you on to talk about your tool ConnectBooks. I've heard more and more things about it. More and more, I see people recommending it on LinkedIn and 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 at events, etc. I wanted to learn more. But maybe before we we dive into that, welcome to the show. Maybe tell us a little bit about how you got here into this uh, into this e-commerce space and a little bit about your background yeah hi Leron. first thanks for having me on the show it's a real pleasure coming on here so my background's actually not i'm not a seller i never was a seller and my background is not programming either so my background is accounting the way i got into this is i five years six years ago i actually went to start my own business i was working for somebody and i started a bookkeeping company um, that focuses on small to medium-sized businesses doing bookkeeping plus CFO services. I'm also an accountant as well. So, you know, I went to school for that part. And then when I finished school is when I wanted to start my business. So as I started my business, I first like half a year was working with a lot of different types of companies. I did construction companies, retail, wholesale. And then I had an Amazon seller approach me and they're like, they wanted to do a buyout. So this was before, this was like five years ago, before anybody even thought of selling their Amazon business. Right. But they were two partners and they were kind of splitting ways. Mm -hmm. And the problem was that partner B was only a partner in, it was a private label brand with 10 products, 10 private label items. And partner B was only a partner in 10 products. I mean, in three out of the 10 products. So partner A was going to buy out partner B. The problem is they had no books. They had no clue how much money the business made. Now, even if they didn't know approximately, they needed exact numbers to understand how much each item made because the deal they were gonna, the deal how much partner A was buying out partner B was only being based on those profitability of those three products, how much those three products made. So I sat like for a few months going through their bank account, every single check, every single PO and invoice and all that, putting it into QuickBooks. And at the same time, I also was logging to Amazon and getting all the reports and, and putting the data and bringing everything in. And I had to do a very thorough, detailed job. So at that point, this light bulb came out to my head. You know, I was looking to expand my bookkeeping company. And I was like, if I can just specialize in the e-commerce space and I really put so much into it, you know, this can kind of spin up my bookkeeping business and, you know, kind of move faster. So originally... When I built ConnectBooks, I wasn't building it to sell as a SaaS. I built it originally for myself just to kind of vent my, you know, kind of speed up my business. And then as I was talking to Amazon sellers, they were like, you know, this is an amazing tool. We would love to use it. And I was like, kind of, you know, I should really start selling this. So we kind did of- you ever, ever, Did you ever think about not selling it? Because, you know, you know, it's also taking away from your accounting services, right? So 
Was that a, you know? So it's, it's a very interesting way because in the beginning, my bookkeeping company was kind of like, you know, I, I did sales on that and I kind of built it. And then it right. went like, a, I would say a little flat. The sales like stayed even because I was busy. I got so busy with the software, I wasn't bringing in any new accounts. But right. then it kind of turned around. It kind of like, once the software started picking up, the software started bringing bookkeeping customers. So what happens is the way it works today is like we have the tool. So if you have your own bookkeeper or you're using a different bookkeeping company that you want to, it's not a problem at all. They can sign up for the software. We will onboard them. We will, we even train our competitors. Like we will right. we'll help you out. And then if you want, like we should do a full package A to Z, like where we do the bookkeeping the QuickBooks, you do nothing. So then, you know, we do a full bookkeeping package. So it's kind of actually today that the software actually brings us a lot of bookkeeping business. And mm -hmm. what we ended up doing in the last year was kind of not already two years that I did it. We kind of took our bookkeeping company and pivoted that we only do bookkeeping for e-commerce. So this kind of like streamlined our bookkeeping process a lot because the people in the office working don't have to be busy doing bookkeeping for contractors. It's like, it, it kind of like, you know, distraught them in, in all different areas. And this is how, you know, it's like they, they do one thing. They just have to know how to do booking for e-commerce and right. they just do that for everybody. And the benefit for the customer is that they're getting a real expert bookkeeping at hand. So right. they're getting like a very big, a good expert and they're getting, you know, it's just, they, it's in, in, in bookkeeping general, I find a lot of times when you outsource is that the people like usually it'll be like a guy who's very experienced, a guy like me who would run the company and then he would hire a lot of junior bookkeepers under them. I find that a lot of times those junior bookkeepers have no clue what they're doing. And the biggest problem is they usually can't work on one account because you don't make money, right? So they have to work at least right. on four to five companies. The problem when they do that is if they, they, ha if they work on, on companies that are in four different industries, they have to learn how to do bookkeeping for four different industries, right. which was for me a very big problem. And at some point in the business, I felt like I was going to bust because it was so much going on. But once we made this change that we only do Amazon, it's just so much easier. And it's, I mean, there's a few lessons here, I think, that anyone can take away for, for any business. One, you know, there's a saying, like, if you're when you're selling to everyone, you're selling to no one, right? Kind of. Oh, yeah. So, you know, if everyone could be a customer, you don't have a focus, you know, focus, you know, kind of niche that you can specifically target in, network in you know, like really like people. Know, people what, I, what I would say is it's a hard pill to swallow because at some point I told people no, and I still do. If somebody calls me up and he's real estate, I say, I don't want to touch it. If you're right. construction, I don't want to touch it. But the good part is that if you kind of wait out that little bit and you get your niche customers, you're like, you could kind of just like sit back and like just do the work and knock out one after the other. And just, it's just, it's exciting to work. It's not like, right. Oh, Right. And I think it's, you know, it's also a lesson because I feel like that's also something that, you know, they say like in your twenties, you know, when you're kind of looking for opportunities, et cetera, you know, I don't know how old you are, but you know, in your twenties, you know, say yes to everything. But by the time you get into your, you know, mid thirties, forties, you should be probably saying more no than yeses, right? Like you should be hopefully established in something and, and be very focused and I know as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure you experience it and a lot of people listening is we always have that like shiny object syndrome, you know, like I can get into this, I can do this and so much opportunity and you want to grab everything. But I think sometimes a lot of it comes from like a place of lack or fear, right? Like, well, just in case this gig doesn't work out so good, I'm going to have this other thing, you know, as, as an additional kind of thing or whatever. But like, there's a lot of power in saying, saying no. And at a certain stage, you should be saying more no than yes in, in a sense you know but but still be open to yes that life-changing opportunity right but everything else yeah. should, should kind of be it's, in that now there's a guy Derek Sivers he he's a guy who built a company so multiple books and he, he has this thing that goes if it's not a hell yes it's a no right <laughs> unless he's super excited about it you know and it's yeah. like absolutely then then it's a no and I think that's kind of a good lesson to to draw here now, I I say one thing on entrepreneurs it's hard to stay focused Sometimes like if there's a Sunday that, you know, like either by me, I have to do something like if it's on a Sunday, like I'll, I don't either I'll do an activity or I go, or I'm going to work one of the two. I'm not going to like just like sit back on the couch. So sometimes if I sit back for and I have like an hour, I'm like, OK, so let me start another business. Let me do this. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> just because you have an extra two hours doesn't mean you want to jump into another business. I, right. I work very hard on being focused. 
And like, I'm a strong believer. I have certain goals where I want to bring my businesses to. And, you know, this is something that goes back all the way back to my youth. And one of my teachers once, mentors, told me that I was having a kind of issue with something. And I, I think I wanted, to, I wanted to switch around schools. Uh-huh. And he told me, he's like, you know, the problem really, you, you have a problem. And that's why it's not working out in the school. And why do you think when you go to a different school, the problem's going to go away? Right. He's like, maybe it'll be good for the first two months and no one knows you. But after two months, you're going to be back in the same spot. So he said, fix your problem now, shape up, and then everything will be good. And, and that actually what happened. I shaped up, I fixed my issue. And I kind of took this lesson up until today. When you have a business and you want to hit a target, like whatever your goal is, if your goal is, if you, whatever your goal is, if your goal is X, don't quit the business until you don't hit your goals. You know why? Because the next business is not going to be easier. It's going to be the same thing. If you suck at sales, and, and you're an entrepreneur, then you just got to work on it. You just got to do it because the other business is going to have to do the same thing as well. So I kind of like had this. Or, br- or bring in the right, the right team, right? Around you. Well, then bring it into this business. If that's right. The, yeah, bring it yeah exactly. Whatever you have to do, you have to do. So I have my commitment that as long as I don't hit my goal, I'm not starting not, not any other business and I'm very focused on it. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. I, 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 I had a couple of stories around that is, heard from a seller that like he he has a hundred million dollar business in the supplement space and he said a couple of years ago you know and he does it with his wife his wife is kind of the face a ceo and he's the president and he said a couple of years ago he got approached by all these people i'm like hey we can raise a lot of money and like buy amazon brands you know and he was like telling his wife like it's an amazing opportunity you know and she said to him please focus on the supplement brand like you know we can we can reach all these goals why go do something else, focus. And he stayed focused. And look, I think it was in hindsight, a great decision, probably not to start an Amazon aggregator, right? When I was in my twenties, I also had this like moving around kind of thing, you know? And this guy said to me, let me tell you a story. It's about a bird and the bird is on the branch and kind of smells bad. Something smells bad. So it goes to another branch, smells bad there too, goes to another branch. And then it looks under its, you know, wing or whatever, and, and there's poop there, right? Like it's not the branch, it's the bird, right? It's kind of kind of like what, what you were saying, you know, like there's something inside of you or whatever, some issue there, and you're trying to escape it and you go you go into another business. It's like I see people like quitting Amazon because they're Amazon support or whatever, all these kind of like issues, but you should try to overcome those issues, you know, like you said, and reach your goals. I think that's a great takeaway. I'm not going to start another business until I hit my goals for this one. It's really, really, really great insight. So yeah, so so let's talk a little bit about the tool. It's Connect Books. Why? Let's say obviously there's there's QuickBooks and there's A2X and, and there's kind of all these tools out there. What did you create that was kind of solving a specific, let's say, problem for for sellers where you, you kind of felt you needed to actually and initially for yourself to create this tool. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So first of all, QuickBooks themselves doesn't have any direct integration, you know, like on, they don't have anything where like the, you can like kind of pull the data in there. So the first problem was that you would be busy going to Amazon, kind of downloading full of different spreadsheets, putting together the whole picture and kind of bring it into QuickBooks. So, you know, that kind of automation out there, that was the first thing that we, you know, we wanted to accomplish. And we wanted to kind of automate the process into QuickBooks. But question number two is why you mentioned like A2X. So we kind of differ a lot. And it, in the beginning, it seems like we're head on competitors. But what I would say is we service two different audiences. And, the, and I told this recently to one of my other, my, my employees. I said, the, the way I started ConnectBooks and if you remember the story I told you is that two people came to me and they said, we want to know exactly how much money we made on each product. We want to split up profitability. Then the other problem was one partner tells me quietly, you know, I believe my other partner embezzled money. And I'm like, okay, Ooh. we'll take a look at that as well. Wow. So, you know, and it, it didn't end up, I mean, in Amazon business, it wasn't embezzlement. He just had, had in order to keep his rank, he had, a very, he had very good products and right. they had very low rankings meaning they were very low. And in order to keep that, he had to keep on ordering a ton of inventory. So, you know, that really where the money was buried. But right. the, the, the way I, I'm a very detailed person and I pay very good attention to detail. 
And when I when I started when I when I was approached to get into the Amazon space, it was on a very detailed level. So our software works very very detailed. Our software is all about clarity. It's about like when I give you a PNL and a balance sheet, well, you're not going to have any questions. And reason is one of the things like we do is like we have on our website we have reporting that gives you profitability per product. Now, the reason why that's so powerful is because that matches back to QuickBooks. So a lot of times I, I've even challenged certain Amazon sales. I'm like, okay, so it says in your QuickBooks you did last month a million dollars and it says that your cost of goods sold, let's say it was 600,000. So let's say you, and then you have all the fees and everything. So I said, how do you know those numbers are accurate? So, you know, the sales, you can kind of try to see in Amazon if it makes sense, but even cost of goods sold, how are you verifying that number $600,000 makes sense? So the only way to verify that is if you have a good breakdown with a clear report giving you the details how they get to that number. And on our website, we give you that breakdown because we tried building those breakdowns in QuickBooks and it was completely a nightmare. So that's why we and we we that's why we built it out on our on our website. So the kind of difference is that we are very detailed. Our audience is people who wanna like who really wanna get to understand the business on a on a very deep level and really know hands on what's going on in the business. They want to know every month their exact profit margins. They want to see if they're moving up, moving down. And they also want to kind of understand which, you know, which, which products they're making money, which products not. I can yeah. say almost every client that we onboard, and once they get fully onboarded, they always have products that they have to cut. They're like, oh, we thought we we're making so much money on this. Oh, we thought we we're making money on this. Oh, we thought we we're making money on this. And they kind of see, like, for example, the biggest things people never calculate is returns. People never calculate, like we have a feature that we calculate on sellable returns. So we have on a return three statuses. Every time a return comes back to Amazon, there's three things that can happen to it. One, it goes back to your inventory. So then, for example, if I if I let's say buy a product from you for 10 bucks, and let's say it costs you five dollars. So I give you 10 bucks and you give me the product. When I give you ten dollars, you made now five dollars profit. Now let's say I come back, I say I want to return it. So you give me back my ten dollars, and I give you back the product. Now, if the product isn't sealed, is sealed and it's brand new, you can resell it. So you only lost five dollars. If the product is damaged and you're gonna throw it in the garbage, then you didn't lose five dollars; you lost ten. So we go through every single return and we check if the condition is sellable. We put it back to your inventory. If the if it's not sellable, then we will then we have to check another criteria: Does Amazon reimburse you for it? because there will be afterwards a reimbursement sale, which Amazon would say, hey, I reimbursed it. So if Amazon reimburses you, then we will take it out later on when the reimbursement comes in as a reimbursement sale. If Amazon doesn't reimburse you and they just say, listen, it's not sellable and they're not reimbursing you, then we expense it fully. So we kind of are very detailed. You're paying a fee for the return too. Yeah, that, that's already included on the financial transaction when it comes in. What right. I'm saying is this is like, for example, this this data that I explained now is not available on the settlement report. It's not available on the date range report. So like all those reports that A2X and other companies pull, they don't have all this kind of granular detail in there because their focus was never detailed. A2X is more of accountants. Their goal is that, you know, they came from a complete different angle than me. They, I want to file your tax returns. I want to make sure you have the, the most tax savings possible. And, you know, in order to file taxes, they need a QuickBooks. In order to have stuff in QuickBooks, you know, they built that integration and where they automate the stuff. Now, if cost of goods sold is not 100% accurate, they don't really care too much. Accountants usually don't care about that. The accountant's goal, unless it's usually going to be the bookkeeper who's going to be working with you on a month-to-month basis, they're going to be the one who wants to make sure the profit margin is there. They're going to want to make sure you have the numbers. The accountant's just going to say, let me see, how much taxes can I save you? Okay, this is your tax bill. This is what you got to pay. Let me close the file, give me my check, and I'll see you next year. So right. that's kind of the main differences between the two of us. And, you know, I came from that aspect, and that's really where, you know, I saw there wasn't any solution, and that's when I decided to build out the tool. Cool. I want to ask you I want to ask you a couple of questions before we get maybe into some of the specific features and, and things that you've worked on. I think you must have a nice perspective of what's been happening in the in the industry let's say the last couple of years last year i want to ask you two questions one what are you seeing what should a private label seller let's say expect in their net margin at the end of the day they sell five million dollars how much you know on average you're seeing what percentage are you seeing 
people actually making on Amazon? I think that's a question. Actually, recently I was at, I was on a panel at TribeWorks in New Jersey or Staten Island. There was an event and somebody there, I guess, who was not selling on Amazon asked like, do people actually make money in this space? You know, which, which, you know, is a fair question. So it'd be interested to see your perspective there. And then also any tips, like what are you seeing as like underutilized opportunities for tax savings that maybe, you know, you see, you see maybe you're advising people to, that are utilizing in terms of tax savings that are not widely used or, or, or maybe like any tips or strategies there. Yeah, sure. So, so the first question is what a good profit margin is. So honestly, I really don't like go through people's data. So I really don't okay. know off the top of my mind unless I work with a company hands-on. Um, right. have, but I will give you this answer. So, and somebody asked me this other question recently, like he was a seller and he's like, tell me, is $50,000 a nice profit? So I told him, look, if you're doing five, what I tell people is, and you see this kind of kicks back to getting clarity. First thing is you want to know what your break-even point on your business is. What is a break-even? So break-even usually gets calculated based on your profit margin. I mean, your overhead divided by your profit margin. So let's say your overhead is $100,000 a month. And let's say your profit margin is on average after all the Amazon fees and the cost of the product, you net 10%. That means to say by a million dollars of sales, you break even. And by $2 million, you make $100,000 profit. So first thing is you want to know what your break even point is. Now, to answer the question, what a nice profit margin is, if let's say somebody does $500,000 a month, and let's say after all fees and cost of goods sold, he's netting 10%, means he makes $50,000 a month. Now it really depends what is his overhead. If he's running the Amazon business out of his basement and he's making you know ten percent, right. that's a nice profit margin. If he's not, then you know if he's not if he's not making a ten percent, meaning say if he's not if he's not if he doesn't have if he has a big overhead, you know, and then ten percent is really nothing. You know, if he has a few payrolls to cover, that eats up all the money right away there. Right. <laughs> so, what the most important part, and I always tell people in terms of gaining clarity is first understand what is your overhead. And when we set up QuickBooks for people, we show them how to like, this is your overhead and this is your contribution margin. Contribution margin means what's a variable cost. The overhead means to say like rent, utilities, meaning if you have no sales tomorrow, what do you, what do you need to have? And then there are fees that get associated to the order, like to the product. So you want to have a clear picture of that. So you want to know from every sale I do, this is what I stay over. Now, I've seen many times also that, People have certain products that move a lot, but the profit margin is low. Now, I ask them, how much time do you spend on this product? So if you have, let's say, I once saw somebody make like $10,000 a month of a certain product, but it was only 2% profit margin. I said, wow. is this something that's taking away a lot? Of, first of all, it also takes away a lot of resources. It's a lot of capital, a lot of money. Right. And, and you know, if you want to hit your certain targets, you're not hitting your target with such a low profit margin. So you got to cut out the product, even though you're not losing money in it, but it's just killing your time. So that's, you know, one thing to look at. And, you know, you want to kind of make sure that- Or, or, is, your cap, or is your capital invested in inventory can yeah, go with another product that's going to give you 8%, right? Or whatever. Right. So what I would say to add, so I would say the first thing is to kind of understand what your break-even point is. When you know your break-even point, um, you know what your, you know, so you know what your profit margin should be, and that will kind of help you drive where you want. The other thing is you also want to make sure that you don't have dead inventory. Um, you don't have inventory that's sitting around. Sometimes you have to just liquidate. I've seen sellers like try to hold on to inventory for months because they want to sell it at a profit, but on the other hand, that ties up a lot of cash. So and you kind of want to make charge fees at Amazon or third-party warehouse, right? Like that. Maybe yeah, not. but Amazon got tight. Now I see everybody complaining yes. about inventory. I mean, last year I've seen people got those crazy charges in Q4, like $60,000 a month just for FBA. Yeah. But this year, I don't know if I saw such a high numbers, but people were a lot more complaining. But well, yeah, the, the numbers are higher in Q4. Amazon yeah, I, high, yeah, but I don't know if they were as high as last year. I don't uh, know if I, I think people had higher limits last year. So the fees were way higher. So right. what I'm saying is that also a lot of times people have a lot of, that inventory, which I call is the biggest silent killer in a business. Like I once, and, and see here also comes in about good books. I had a customer that made last year 1.4 million in profit. So for first glance, I would say, wow, that's so nice. But on the second glance, we checked this balance sheet. 
In the beginning of the year, he had $3 million of inventory. And at the end of the year, he had $6 million of inventory. So that $1.4 million was buried in that inventory. So basically, no money for him. You know, so you kind of have to like really have the clarity and then that part. Now, to answer the real question is what is a good profit margin? What I would really say, I've seen private labels do something called use an ROI. So an ROI is your return on investment. So profit margin is really a metric used to calculate your break-even point. ROI is a different margin, which all these margins are available on ConnectBooks, which is your return on investment. So for example, if I was to give you $1,000, what would you do with it? You, it doesn't, you wouldn't buy a product that you make 50% profit. If you want to buy a product, you want to look at the ROI. ROI means to say, let's say I sell a product for $100. My cost is, let's say, 50 Right, so I made fifty. So I made fifty dollars profit. So my return on investment is hundred percent because I had fifty and I got now another yeah. fifty. So you want to get with the highest ROI. Plus, you also want to monitor your turnover ratio, which turns over faster. So what I have seen is good. Good sellers have, I would say, like a four hundred percent return ROI. Not not profit margin, but four hundred percent return ROI on private label. Those tend to do very very well. Those people. So. 400% return on investment after fees, right? That, right. So let's say the product cost you $5 and you could kind of net your net, your, the cost of well, the cost of the product is five, but let's say they're selling it or let's say for 50 and they end up like 25% profit. That's like a 400% ROI. Right. Which Got is it. a 50% profit margin. Right. Got it. Yes. But the, but the 50% not necessarily is always so good. It's, it's more, I, I, I like to see it the high of uh, 400% ROI, which usually those, those usually don't have issues with cash flow. They're, they're, right. they, they usually have money all the time. It's, a, it's, a high, it's, it's definitely a high ROI because buying something at five and selling for 50 is not so common. I, look, I don't, know, I, I, I don't know offhand, but I have seen those numbers like 200 to 300% ROI. Right. I have seen those numbers many right. times and to answer your question if people make money yes i would say a lot of people make money on amazon i usually get to deal with more like settled amazon businesses meaning because usually when you That's start cool. off usually when people start off they'll probably come more to you because they'll need some advertising books is the last thing on their mind so usually once the kind of the business settles in and you know it's like already they're already doing like i say at least a half a million a year or more usually at that point they kind of you know trying to get um they're trying to, you know, get some books and get stuff set up properly. So that's usually at that point where they'll come to me. But, you know, I would say the businesses that are really solid and really have a grip on what's going on, you know, they make a lot of money. Right. And actually, even, even for us, we generally will not take on somebody who doesn't have a profitable business and isn't spending around at least 10000 a month on ads. And that's because you know, it's harder to stay with an agency when you're not making money or when you're not making much money. Right. And, and what we see is that sometimes, sometimes people come to us as a less effort when they're, when they're not profitable, you know, like things are wrong, like maybe you could make magic, which we can't. And, you know, we're our, as an agency, we're, you know, limited to how many people we can work with based on our capacity and team, et cetera. And we do, we do hire and we have I don't know, 90 people or so, but we want to work with businesses that make sense for them to hire us. And when you're starting out, you should try to do as much as you can yourself and learn and, you know, or, 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 or not hire because a more established agency, I, I think, unless you're funded and you know, the investment, you know, you're making an investment, which maybe is a little bit of a different story, but kind of the same way we, we want to work with businesses that are, that are already settled somewhat and, and want to grow. So you mentioned, I think some, some new features, things you're working on in terms of, of the tool. What are, what are some of those, what are some of those things? And it sounds to me like, I guess you're connecting into, which is why it's called connect books into QuickBooks, right? Um, right. Yeah. So we connect with QuickBooks. We connect with desktop online, all versions of QuickBooks. Um, some of the new features, like we recently rolled out something called how to calculate shipping costs. So what happens is a lot of sellers, I mean, I mean, last year the problem was worse than this year. Last year everybody was paying like twenty thousand dollars a container, but right. now you're paying now the prices are down back to like five thousand. But what happens is that a lot of people want to know what is their exact cost of goods sold? What is my cost of the product? So I buy it in China, I pay like five dollars a unit. Question is, what is it, you know, what what the cost would be 
in terms of, you know, my shipping cost and, you know, kind of calculate all that. So the complicated part is let's say you have a container and in the container you have, let's say 10 different, you have 10 yeah. different products. Right. You want to take the shipping cost of that container and split it among the 10 products. So you can't just split it based on the, on the dollar, what each product costs. And you can't split it, you know, you have to split it based on the volume because let's right. say you're shipping an office chair and an iPhone, the office chair costs $50, iPhone costs $1,000, but the office chair costs way more to ship. So right. what, what we did is we built out a tool where basically you take, we give you all your products from QuickBooks and you give us the dimensions. So it's like a one-time setup. You upload the dimensions per product. And then what we do is we're going to pull all your manufacturing bills and all your shipping bills from QuickBooks. And we, you just have to like select this manufacturing goes to this shipping bill. And then you just hit, you hit update. And what we do is we take all that information and send it back to QuickBooks. So the thing, one of the things I like, like, you know, I think that's good for me that I have the bookkeeping together with the software is that I actually do hands on bookkeeping all day. And this process of allocating the shipping to a product would literally take us 20 to 30 minutes per invoice because we would take the invoice from QuickBooks. Okay, let's see what's in here. Then we would need to take a spreadsheet, get the CBM of each product. Then we would need to take the total shipping amount, split it by the CBM, and then go back to QuickBooks and do all the allocations. And then we also had to have like a sheet where we kept track of which bills were allocated, which one wasn't. So that's how, you know, we make sure everything gets allocated. With the software, it's literally a, a two minute process. So it's like literally like took each bill. So if you have like four to five containers to bring in a month, instead of spending a few hours, we literally just do it in two minutes. And also a lot of times people just don't know how to do it. It's, it's not an easy task getting it into Excel sheet. You have to make sure the formula works. If one formula is not, somehow you by mistake, you know, type something and just didn't do one formula right, then you have to kind of spend like 10 minutes figuring out which formula got broken and how to kind of, you know, do that all. So what we do is we kind of like import it. And the, also the other thing is very cool is that we also bring in the memo. So like when you enter a bill in QuickBooks, you could like put in the memo, which container it is. And then we enter the shipping bill, you also put in the memo, which container it is. And then when you come to our software, you just search by container number. We give you all the bills, all the shipping bills. Like you can have three different manufacturing bills and let's say 10 different shipping bills and we'll just allocate everything. Based on the based on the CBM, and then we'll also we'll calculate for you the tariff rates. So you also that's part of the setup, which you tell us how much the tariff is on each product. So this is how you kind of get to know your true cost per product and kind of you know understand everything what's going on. Got it. And so as a company, you offer both sort of software only or software plus services. Yeah essentially got it and uh, what's your i mean do most people use you for both or no i would say we have on the on the software we have over a thousand customers wow the bookkeeping is not nowhere close to that it's it's the bookkeeping is a little different it's more of a premium service and right. you know like our our bookkeeping our bookkeeping prices start at a thousand a month that's our starting price you won't go under that the software right. starts from 25 dollars a month and goes up there Right, uh, but we do work with a lot of other bookkeepers, and we have established a network right. of other bookkeepers. So, like, if we're not the right fit for the bookkeeping, we can recommend somebody. As a matter of fact, next week we're gonna have on our website an accountant page. Like, we're gonna list vetted accountants who we have vetted, and you know they know the process. But if you have an accountant who you want to use or a bookkeeper you want to use, we'll be more than happy to, to train them and show how it works. Right. So somebody could be very happy with their bookkeeper and then they introduce them to the software and let them give them access. Right. One question I asked before, I think we didn't touch on is any overlooked or opportunities. I know we just got, you know, finished with the year and uh, there, there may be still some opportunities for, for tax savings, for example, like a SEP IRA, th things like that, that you can still do for last year. But in general, what, what do you see as maybe mm, opportunities for people to save on their taxes or where they're not maximizing. So really, they, really taxes is not my specialty. Okay. Uh, and I go back to the thing. I'm very focused. One of the businesses, I'm actually an accountant. I went to school. I have a master's degree in accounting. But at this point, I have so much on my plate. I, I can really file tax returns, but I don't want to do it because I, I feel like I would need to really specialize in that. And, Got it. you know, and I'm still working on my goals. But what I do do is 
I work with a lot of CPAs. So let's say, for example, when I do bookkeeping, we tell the customer we'll take care of A to Z. We will hook them up with an accountant who specializes and we deal with a wide range of accountants, expensive ones, cheap ones. So the first thing is what I always tell somebody, first thing is you have to have the good books because you have to know what's going on. If you don't know right. what's going on, there's no way to do tax saving. So right. if you didn't make any money, then go use the cheapest accountant out there. An accountant, right. accountants start at like $300 for tax filing, for, even for corporations. Right. So you can have an accountant who charges you 300 and an accountant who charges you 10,000. But right. if you make no money, take a cheap account. Don't, right. don't be busy with it. And what I would say, there's a couple of stuff to look out there. First thing is make sure you have your accurate inventory number year end. So what I've seen many times happen, let's say your QuickBooks shows at the year end, you have a million dollars worth of inventory. It's very possible that you only have 700,000 worth of inventory. Or let's say you have inventory that's older than a year or mm-hmm. older than six months, which you can which you consider obsolete mm-hmm. because you don't think you'll sell them. You can write that off. So you want to make sure that your inventory number is the most accurate. And that's how you bring down your profits. And the other thing is you also want to make sure like you're recording everything properly. Like for example, interest on an Amazon loan, I see people forget to record, you know, that can also be another good tax savings and just kind of make sure everything is up to date. And, you know, and then the accountant usually, you know, based on the profit margins, you know, you can kind of choose. You know, if you're like, I have a customer that showed last year after everything, like a half a million dollars profit. So I hooked her up with a really good accountant who is very aggressive and, you know, kind of like tries to see, you know, what, you know, we need creativity in that field. And right. then, you know, if it's not so, something crazy, you know, if they just make like $50,000, I would we'll just send it to someone else. Right. Right. Yeah. I know. I know. I just put money in a SEP IRA to save, you know, a bunch of money on, on taxes for this year. So, I mean, not a, it's not yeah, a you can do like you can do a clat. There's a lot of stuff you can do. A lot of right. things you can you know kind of work on. I mean, you could also at year end still buy certain equipment. You know, I know a lot of business do these. I think it's called Section 179, which gives small businesses. Usually, if you spend, let's say you let's say you need new computers, new servers. Usually, you would want to. It will be capitalized, and you would appreciate over a couple of years, meaning over the useful life of the product. However, there is a rule that for small businesses, you could appreciate you know, the full amount in the first year. So mm-hmm. sometimes, but the thing is, it's over already. So right. if that's, you can do it year end. But I would say at this point, once everything is over, you know, just make sure you have your accurate inventory numbers because accurate inventory numbers makes the biggest difference on your P&L. Right. Makes, makes a lot of sense. How can people connect with you, follow you, and also, you know, check out the tool? Sure. They can come to our website, connectbooks.com. We have live chat or anything like that. And we will have a special code for the listeners of the show. We'll be offering them, we'll give them 10% off for the first 12 months. And we'll, they can, they should put in the coupon code. What's a good coupon code to put in? They can put in, uh, make it easy, uh, Liron 10. Okay. Yeah, perfect. So just put in Liron 10 and we'll have that coupon code working later today. And that's going to give them 10% off for the first 12 months. However, we will limit this coupon to the first 25 signups. So... You guys got to come in and grab a quick because otherwise it's going to expire and there won't be anything left after. Great. Thank you. I didn't know. I didn't know you were going to offer that. So appreciate that. And then, you know, I know you're also active in events, et cetera. And, you know, I'll, I'll link to your LinkedIn also in the show notes if anybody wants to reach out or connect to you directly as well. So thank you so much for, for coming on, looking forward to, you know, seeing how you continue to grow it and, you know, and develop it. And and if you do start another business, I, I will know that you hit your goal with, with, <laughs> with this one. So I'll be, I'll be watching, but thank you so much for, for coming on and sharing. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you.